Uh, so for the last talk of this uh, workshop, we have the pleasure to listen to Corbett Dillon from Yale University. And he will talk about the twinkle circle of reduction of admissible representations of affinity algebra. Great, oh, thanks a lot, Daniel. So um, first I, I, I wanna say that I, I'm really grateful to get an opportunity to speak. I, I really have enjoyed a lot of the activities from this year, watching the recordings, going to some of the seminars, and to get a chance to contribute something myself, it really is an honor. So I'm very grateful. So, um, so what is the story that I'm going to try to tell you about today? So, um, so to each semi-simple Lie algebra G, there's another important algebra associated to it called the W algebra. And so they were first constructed by physicists in the late '80s. Um, and they were first introduced into the mathematical literature along with the uniform construction of them um, in 1990 by the work of Fagan and Frankel. And so um, this paper has a lot of beautiful ideas. It's been very influential. Um, and at the very end of it, they mention a, a very remarkable conjecture, which they made jointly with Katz and Wakimoto, um, which proposed a very nice correspondence between certain representations of affine Lie algebras and certain representations of W algebras. Um, and so what I want to talk about today is, uh, well, the main result of this talk is that the conjecture is, is true, essentially. Um, but I, I want to spend most of the time giving sort of a motivated and somewhat leisurely introduction to this whole, whole part of the world. Um, so here are a few comments before I get started. So the first is just um, sort of in, in recognition of the fact this is the last talk on the last day of a very interesting, but slightly exhausting conference. Uh, I'm going to suppress a bunch of row shifts, signs, constants, completions, et cetera. Um, so that being said, you know, if you have questions about those things or anything else, please don't hesitate to ask. Okay. So <clears throat> the good news in some sense is that um, for, for a non-specialist, you can really get your teeth into the heart of the subject by just remembering some things about two classical functions from number theory, namely the eta function and the theta function. And I'm gonna start off by reminding you of some of the properties of these animals. So let's start with the eta function. <clears throat> so, um, so as representation theorists, we certainly owe a great deal to the partitions. So for a non-negative integer n, let's just write p sub n for the number of partitions of n. And so um, one assembles these into a generating function, h of q, where q is a formal variable and um, the coefficient of q to the n is just the number of partitions of n. And so when you assemble these into this um, generating function, you get a nice product decomposition. So namely, if you take a partition and you ask um, how many columns of size one are there, or how many columns of size two are there, or how many columns of size three, et cetera, you have in the partition, you get this product formula. So it's H of Q is the product of a bunch of geometric series. Each one um, has charge Q to the I, if you wish. So, let me tell you two remarkable facts about uh, the partition function. So the first is there's some sort of sum equals product identity. So to state it, uh, let's work not with the partition function, but it's reciprocal. So just the product of these one minus Q to the i's. So then um, a, a wonderful theorem of Euclid from 1775 says <laughs> that there's an equality of series between this product and a certain sum. So namely, when you multiply this out, there's a tremendous amount of cancellation. The only coefficients of Q which survive, they're either gonna be it's a positive one or a negative one. And sort of from one to Q to the N, there's roughly square root N, many non-zero coefficients. And more precisely, the coefficients which you get um, are, are the, the pentagonal numbers. So it's zero, one, two, five, seven, 12, 22, 26, et cetera. And so um, if you're wondering why they're called the pentagonal numbers, um, it's just the following thing. So you draw the smallest pentagon you can, it has one vertex. You draw a slightly larger one, 
has five vertices. And um, you know, if you keep on going, uh, you'll get 12, et cetera. And uh, sort of roughly, then if you take pentagons with negative side length, it gives the other half. Okay. Uh, may I ask a question? Please. Why do you uh, attribute the theorem to Euclid? Um, <laughs> because uh, I really should have attributed it. I thought he theory. was dead by uh, 1775. Yeah. Um, okay. Hopefully, this is one of the less egregious errors I'll make. Thanks. Yeah. That's definitely Euler's pentagonal theorem. Thanks a lot. I've, yeah. Um, okay. And so uh, this, this theorem in particular gives you a nice recurrence for how to compute the number of partitions of n. Uh, so the number of partitions of n, the way you get it is it's the number of partitions of one less, two less, and then you subtract five less, seven less, and you keep on alternating like this. Um, and so, uh, you know, this, this, this circle of ideas it has a rich history. So for example, uh, when in Cambridge in the early 20th century, they tested Ramanujan's uh, asymptotic expression for the number of partitions. Uh, so I think they, they checked it against the number of partitions of 200. And the way that McMahon did this was exactly using this. OK, so that's the first remarkable fact. You have some sum equals product identity for the partition function. Um, and then a second fact is that it's, it's quite useful to consider the partition function not just as a formal power series, but namely, if you write Q as e to the two pi i tau, then um, this converges provided tau is in the upper half plane. And you just want the modulus of Q to be less than one. So since you're writing it as a Fourier series, just kind of for free, you have that h of tau is h of tau plus one. A sign that this is a good idea to do is that, um, in fact, the function you get has modular properties. So it transforms nicely under the substitution, tau goes to minus one. So again, the upshot for us is just that Q really wants to be e to the two pi i tau. Okay, so that was the eta function. Let me tell you a bit about the theta function. So the theta function, it's a function of one more variable, z. And again, it's gonna be a Fourier series. So let's write w for e to the two pi i z. So the theta function is given by sum over the integers. And one can think of the integers as sort of the simplest lattice. And you take sort of the usual dot product where one has squared length one, um, and you use for each, as you run over each lattice point, Q remembers the squared length of your vector and W just remembers which vector. You take. And so this, on the one end, it's a formal series, but it, it converges to a, a holomorphic function in uh, any value of Z and tau in the upper half plane. So let me tell you a few beautiful properties of the theta function. So, uh, the first is that there's again some sum equals product identity. So this one is due to Jacobi from 1829. And it tells you that the theta function, you can write it as a certain product. And so for our purposes today, um, the specific terms in the product are not particularly important. Um, but just the only thing to note is that sort of for each power of Q, more or less, there are three terms. One has no W in it. One has one W in it, the other has W in this. And these later are gonna be roughly the F, the H, and the E in an SL2. Okay. And so um, one consequence of this, which will be important for us is that once you have this, it's really easy to read off where the zeros of the theta function are. So namely, if you consider tau as a parameter, and you do it as a function of one holomorphic variable Z, um, you get zeros along a certain lattice. So the picture is the following. So you take, you make a parallelogram with sides one and tau, and then there's exactly one zero in this parallelogram, namely sort of in some sense the midpoint, of the parallelogram. And then the other zeros are all kind of, you kind of extend this into sort of some doubly periodic picture over the whole complex plane. You get one simple zero in each parallelogram. Okay, so that's uh, the, the sum equals product identity. And then it also has modularity properties. So namely, um, the details of them are not important for us, but um, let me just note, for example, that this kind of periodicity in the zeros we saw 
that's that's a special feature of a general quasi periodicity of the function under substitution z goes to z plus one and z goes to z plus tau. Okay, so um, we've met the eta function, we've met the theta function. Uh, the, the really important thing about the two of them for us in this talk is uh, that there, there's a very close relationship between them. So namely, you can obtain uh, the partition function from the theta function by taking an appropriate residue. So where should you take it? Well, we said that um, we know where all the zeros of this function are. And so you can look at sort of the first Taylor coefficient there, or equivalently, you can flip it over and take the residue. And then the nice identity is that when you take the residue of the theta function in Z to get rid of Z, what you're left with, sorry, excuse me, uh, what you're left with is the uh, partition function cubed in tau. And so this cube, let's just, it's not, you should really kind of ignore it for the purposes of this talk. So, and this was used, for example, by Dedekind uh, when he studied the modularity properties of the eta function. So um, here are the only things that we need to remember from part one. So there's two functions, the eta function and the theta function. Um, one of them is a function of one complex variable. The other is a function of two complex variables, z and tau. Both admit product equals sum identities. And you get the eta function from the theta function by taking an appropriate residue, OK? So um, that's it for this part of the talk. Are there questions so far? Okay, so <laughs> let's go out to part two. So we're gonna meet some representation theoretic, uh, in some sense, partners to the eta function and the theta function. So these are gonna be the Virasoro algebra and the affine Lie algebra associated to SL2. So let's start with the Virasoro. So to build it, consider first um, the Lie algebra of vector fields on a formal puncture disk. So Concretely, this just means, uh, it looks like a Laurent series in T times the standard vector field D by DT with the usual Lie bracket. And so um, an important fact is that many things which naively seem like they should be representations of this, um, in fact, are representations of a, it's sort of its universal central extension. That's the Virasoro Lie algebra. Um, and so um, like most Lie algebras that have sort of a special place in representation theory. This has a nice triangular decomposition. It's a sort of lowering operators, a Cartan and raising operators. Let me tell you how you get these. So you roughly get them by just doing loop rotation in your variable T. So namely, um, if you sort of take the eigenstates for loop rotation, you get these vector fields, which just looks like a monomial in T times D by DT. Um, and the minus signs there is some sort of convention. And so now that you have this Z grading, you can uh, get a triangular decomposition. So, so the point is that the, the loop rotation plays the role of row check for a semi-simple Lie algebra. So it's some sort of height grading. Um, and so concretely, so VIR zero, it consists of L zero, which is roughly the Euler vector field, T dt. And it also has our central element C. Um, Vir minus consists of all the lowering operators. So L minus one, L minus two, L minus three, et cetera. And then Vir plus consists of the topological span of the remaining uh, vector fields, L1, L2, L3. Okay. So um, the Virasor algebra has a nice category of highest weight representations, the category O. And so you build them from the triangular decomposition exactly the way you think. So namely, you can construct the Verma modules. And so they're going to be labeled by sort of, sort of a simultaneous eigenvector for the Cartan. So you have two labels here. So namely, you have some highest weight line. And sort of C is going to record sort of the central charge. So that's how our central element acts on the entire representation. And delta is going to record sort of the eigenvalue of L0. So delta stands for conformal dimension. Okay. 
And so when you take the uh, character of one of these Verma modules, well, so a priori, you have two you know, linearly independent things in your carton, but one of them is central. So really, there's one interesting thing to keep track of, which is the L0 or energy grading. And uh, you get the following expression for the character. So namely, you get the highest weight line, and then you get all the excitations produce uh, a copy of the partition function. So um, IE, the, the vial denominator for uh, the Virasor algebra is the eta function we met before. And so by the way, so just explicitly, why do we get these things in the denominator? So recall that the lowering operators were L minus one, L minus two, L minus three, et cetera. In particular, the Verma module, it looks like the enveloping algebra of Vir minus. Um, and so in particular, if you take some PBW filtration of it, you'll just get um, sort of polynomials in the lowering operators. So that's, that's, that's why you get that expression. So the one minus Q corresponds to L minus one, one minus Q squared, L minus two, et cetera. Okay. So um, you can ask, uh, can you recognize some of these identities about the partition function in representation theory? The answer is yes. So um, for example, Euler's identity is the following statement. Uh, so the Virasor algebra has a trivial module and you can resolve that trivial module by Verma modules. So um, the trivial module, it has central charge zero and conformal dimension zero. So it's rejected onto by that Verma module. Then um, there are two generators for the kernel of that surjection, namely L minus one of the vacuum and L minus two of the vacuum. So you get uh, these two Verma modules and you keep on going. And the nice thing is that the conformal dimensions of the things you get are exactly the pentagonal numbers. So zero, one, two, five, seven, et cetera. So in particular, when you take the Euler characteristic of this resolution, you get Euler's identity. Sorry, can you, can you say again a little what you mean by conformal dimension or repeat it? I'm not sure if you said it. It's, it's, uh, it's like the weight for the highest weight for, for how L0 acts on the highest weight line of the Verma module. Yeah. Thanks. Sure, so, so again, so we said Virasoro in some sense matches the eta function so let's talk about uh, what matches the theta function. So that's going to be affine SL2. So if you consider the Lie algebra of SL2 currents on a formal puncture disk, so concretely, that's just uh, two by two traceless matrices with Laurent series ent entries and just the usual commutator. Then um, when you consider it as just a infinite dimensional Lie algebra over C, it has, again, like the Virasor algebra, there's, um, it has a, a universal central extension, and that's the affine Lie algebra, affine SL2. And so it again has some triangular decomposition, and the way you get it is by considering how loop rotation acts on it, taking eigenstates for that, and then um, that almost breaks you up in the desired form, but if you consider the, the zero modes, that's just a copy of finite dimensional SL2, namely just SL2 tensor just one. And so you need to further break that up using a triangular decomposition for SL2. So the point is that affine SL2 has this nice triangular decomposition where um, the carton consists of H tensor one and our central element, the raising operators, that's E tensor one, and then sort of everything in sort of power series, which vanish at the identity, and uh, the lowering operators, it's you have F tensor one, and then you have sort of everything with a negative power of T. Okay. So um, again, you have a nice category O on the triangular decomposition. You can consider the Verma modules. They depend on two parameters, namely sort of K keeps track of the eigenvalue of one, our central element, and lambda keeps track of the eigenvalue of H from our finite dimensional carton. So, um, so 
a priori, when you look at this, if you think about what the characters should look like, you might only think that there's diagonalizing with respect to the finite dimensional Cartan H. But a nice fact um, is that, in fact, any affine SL2 module has a canonical compatible action of loop rotation. Um, so this is something called the Sugawara construction. And so given this, um, you can consider the characters, which are now functions of two variables, but namely, again, so Q is keeping track of the L0 or energy of an uh, eigenspace, and um, W is keeping track of H, the H eigenvalue. And so, um, so there's two things I want to highlight about this formula. So the first is that the, the, the denominator up to a change of variables is exactly the theta function. So um, namely, we said before, the theta function looked like some product of three things. Um, and indeed, so the W corresponds to E. And so we have E, H, and F. And the other aspect of this I want to emphasize is that um, when you look at the, the energy grading of the highest weight line, it's roughly, it goes quadratically with the highest weight. So it's something like Q to the lambda squared, okay? So something about a Casimir determining uh, the energy of the highest weight line. Okay, and so just like we said for Virasoro, um, a sign that, you know, Appen SL2 really sees some useful properties of the data function, so you, certainly you can see Jacobi's identity. So again, you take a trivial module, you can take some sort of resolution of it by Verma modules, and um, when you take the characters, that recovers Jacobi's uh, triple product for me. Um, so an aspect of this, which is going to be very important for us is, so, so we've matched the eta function to Virasoro, we've matched the theta function to affine SL2, and one would like to make sense of this last important feature, which is that you can pass from theta to eta by taking a residue, yeah? So you can ask the question, what is the representation theoretic counterpart or is there a representation theoretic counterpart of that residue operation? So just working formally at the level of characters, um, you can now just turn any character of a highest weight representation of SL2 into, the, into sort of a virtual representation of the Virasoro algebra um, by again, just using this, this residue um, to get rid of the Z variable, which corresponds to the, the Cartan. So you're only left with the energy grade. And so um, certainly this will send Verma characters to Verma characters. That's just the statement that theta goes to eta. Um, but you can ask if it has any meaning beyond that. And so it was a beautiful observation of some physicists, namely Knizhnik, Polyakov, and Zamolajikov, and Muki and Panda, that this, this residue operation, it, it seems to have representation theoretic meaning. So namely, um, what they showed was that it sends certain simple characters for affine SL2 to simple characters for Virasoro or zero. And so which characters were they interested in? So um, they were interested in a class of representations called the admissible highest weight representations of affine SL2. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what those are later, but for now it's just some simple highest weight modules. So um, you can ask, what does the passage from theta to eta, what form does it take at the level of not growth and D groups, but the actual categories? And so this is, this is the question that Fagan and Frankel answered in their 1990 paper. So namely what they said is the analog of taking the residue on characters is doing something called uh, BRST or quantum Drinfeld sokolov reduction to the representation itself. So it's some sort of semi-infinite version of taking cohomology. So, um, so here's what you do. So you start with a representation of affine SL2. You view it just as a representation of just the loop algebra of E. Um, and you roughly want to kill that action. But more precisely, you want to kill a slight twist of that action. So uh, you tensor your representation by a, an important one-dimensional character of this loop algebra. So namely, what it does is it sends a uh, Laurent series times E to just the coefficient of T to the minus one. So namely chi ds of E times T to the minus one is one. And you apply it to any other 
monomial in T and you get zero. And so, um, so explicitly, this semi-infinite cohomology, if you've never thought about it before, so here's roughly what it is. So for a finite dimensional Lie algebra, you have Lie algebra homology, you have Lie algebra cohomology. And um, a basic fact is that up to a shift and perhaps tensoring your representation by some determinant character, they give you the exact same thing. So there's really only one cohomology theory that's reasonable for finite dimensional Lie algebras. And the claim is that for infinite dimensional Lie algebras, there's kind of only one reasonable cohomology theory, i.e. say it has good continuity properties. Um, and so the rough idea is that normal homology has some problems, normal cohomology has some problems. They kind of have complementary problems. So you take something halfway between them, but you roughly, you start halfway through the, uh, the exterior algebra of your Lie algebra. So that's what this semi-infinite means. You roughly start in the middle. Okay. And so just, if you haven't seen this before, the other thing to notice is that sort of the co-chain complex that's computing this BRST reduction, it's, it's, it's really, it's by infinite. So just for every, in every, in every degree, you have a non-trivial uh, element of your chain complex or vector space in your chain complex. Okay. And so indeed what they showed is that this BRST reduction, it recovers the residue on characters. So um, I think it's worth saying a little bit about where this comes from or why they would think to do this. So again, so the residue, we had Z and tau and we're getting rid of Z and we're remembering only tau. Right? You were only remembering something about the energy gradient, okay? And what we said was that for Verma modules, this energy grading, it roughly went quadratically in lambda. And so that's something about how the Casimir acts on the corresponding finite dimensional representation of finite dimensional SL2. So, so roughly speaking, what this BRST procedure is, it's um, some affine analog of a procedure just for finite dimensional Lie algebras, which lets you remember just the Casimir, or more generally the, the center of the finite dimensional enveloping algebra, if you're in the higher rank Lie algebra, it's, it's how you can build that center um, from the entire enveloping algebra by a Hamiltonian reduction. But namely, um, if you just take the restriction map from G star to N star, and you take a generic character in N star, so say chi of E equals one and what we said before, then if you take the corresponding reduction, so namely you take the pre-image of chi under the moment map, and then you sort of mod out by the action of n. So it's a, it's a nice theorem of constant that um, the, the affine variety you get, i.e. the invariant theory quotient, is just g star mod mod g, OK? So the point is that there, there's, there's a close relationship between doing these sorts of Hamiltonian reductions and cutting down from all of u of g just to the center. And so for SL2, we're going from affine SL2 to just something about, something about a Casimir, and that's why this BRSD reduction is a natural thing to try. Okay, and so um, you can ask now what to make of the character observations performed by the physicists. Um, and so what Fagan and Frankel showed was that this BRSD reduction, it, it indeed sends these simple admissible modules for affine SL2 to simple Virasoro modules concentrated in cohomological degrees zero, okay? Um, and so think of this, this recovers the character observation from before. And in fact, what they showed is that this BRST, it was exact on all of category O. And in fact, it sent any simple module to a simple module or zero. Um, so the last thing I wanna mention is that they explained how to use BRST, not just to produce modules for the Virasoro algebra, but how to produce the entire Virasoro algebra itself. So, Namely, what they said was that you can build the enveloping algebra of Virasoro from the enveloping algebra of SL2 by a slight variant of this BRST procedure, where instead of an exterior algebra in N, you use a Clifford algebra. But this is, this is a technical point. So what's important is that um, there's some version of BRST which you apply to the entire enveloping algebra itself. Um, so it's, it's roughly, it's actually really nice. They, they call this procedure, it's some sort of Hecke algebra construction, but now for 
the algebra is instead of say, you know, functions on a group or D modules on a group or something. So the point is that you take this Hecke algebra construction, you apply it to the enveloping algebra of affine SL2, and it cuts you down to just the enveloping algebra of the Virasoro element. Um, and again, there's some magic here where a priori you have some coaching complex with you know, in every single cohomological degree, and the claim is that the cohomology is exactly in degree zero, and it's just enveloping algebra of Virasoro. Okay, so here's a summary of part two. So in part one, we met the eta function and the theta function. We're saying that roughly the eta function is the denominator for the Virasoro algebra. The theta function is the denominator for affine SL2. And the residue relation between the theta function and the eta function is some shadow of the BRST functor between uh, the categories of highest weight representations of affine SL2 and Virasoro. Okay, so um, let me pause here to see if there are any questions. Okay, so um, in, in the last section of the talk, I, I just wanna mention, so in some sense, how this story extends from the rank one case to the case of a general semi-simple Lie algebra, and that's what we'll meet, Frankel Katz Wakimoto's conjecture. Okay, so um, briefly, what's the analog of affine SL2 for a general semi simple Lie algebra? So um, consider a semi simple Lie algebra G with a triangular decomposition, n minus t and n. Um, so if the Lie algebra is simple, again, you basically have only one non trivial central extension. And so you get this thing called the affine Lie algebra, G hat. So it's, it looks like just the current algebra. So I eat now just roughly matrices, not just two by two matrices, but say n by n matrices for GLN for the Lamont series entries. And then you add this one central element, so you have this co cycle. So, um, so that's who the affine, w, the affine Lie algebras are. So who are the W algebras? Well, the rough idea is. Um, so you can just reverse engineer a definition of them by just applying this Hecke algebra construction of Fagan and Frankel. So namely, uh, so just fix a generic character of the finite dimensional Lie algebra. So chi going from N to C. And again, you can sort of just take a residue to turn this into a character of the loop algebra or the current algebra. So again, sort of concretely, what this kind of thing will look like is that say chi of a simple, uh, simple, simple raising operator is one for all simple EI. And then when you loop it, it's just the same thing, but now it's just EI time, times T inverse. That's the one that survives and all the other ones die. Okay, so now you can play the same Clifford algebra game. And again, you get just one algebra concentrated in cohomological degree zero. I um, mean, that's the W algebra. And again, um, you have a semi-infinite cohomology or BRST reduction functor that goes from all representations of the affine Lie algebra and gives you complexes of representations of the W algebra. And um, again, there's, there's, you can do a certain residue on characters of the affine Lie algebra, and that'll produce the corresponding character of the BRST reduced uh, module. So again, this is some version of theta going to eta. Okay, so you can ask um, why why are the W algebras important, or when might I meet them? And so there, there's a few reasons that I mean uh, among many that I'll mention to you. So the first is so they were first introduced by physicists in the late '80s. And the reason why physicists found them were sort of, they showed up as sort of extensions of just Virasoro symmetry in conformal field theory. Um, so some important names here is Amalogikov who found the W algebra for SL3, um, Bateyev and Lokionov and uh, many others. So in mathematics, I, part of the, the reason that they've, uh, certain people are quite enamored of them is that they, they play very important role in the geometric Langlands program. Um, so namely, 
in, in the usual geometric line lens correspondence. Um, so there's, there's this beautiful identity, due to Fagan and Frankel, that says that, um, in some sense, the commutative limit of the W algebra associated to G. So in, in spirit with this relation to Casimir's and this kind of thing, in this, in this special case, what the W algebra is, is it's just the center of the enveloping algebra of G hat at critical level. So it's kind of buried in the heart of uh, the representation theory of G. And on the other hand, it has a dual realization as um, the, the algebra of functions on a certain moduli space of uh, sort of connections on the formal puncture disk. Uh, but the key point is that it's their connections for the Langlands dual group. So the point is that W algebras sort of, they have wired into them, they know about Langlands duality. Um, so, so that's uh, some certain classical limit um, but the claim is that sort of, sort of for, for, for most values of K, I mean, it's not just some commutative algebra, but instead a remarkable thing that Fagan and Frankel showed was that um, the above isomorphism is, is, is a specialization of a more general thing, which says that the W algebra for G at any level K is, it's always a W algebra for the Langlands dual group where you sort of, you invert uh, the level or the coupling. So, um, so in some sense, this 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 identity suggested to people that there should be a whole quantum deformation of the geometric Langlands program. That's something which has been receiving a lot of interest recently. It's called the quantum geometric Langlands correspondence. Okay. So um, let me now say a little bit about what are these representations that we're going to feed into the BRST complex. So first, let's just start with all highest weight representations of uh, the affine Lie algebra. So again, you have Verma modules and they're simple quotients. And what are they labeled by? So and for SL2, there was a Z and a tau. And so the Z was something about um, H, the Cartan element, and the tau was something about the energy grading. And so it's something entirely similar here. So you have two labels. So K keeps track of um, sort of the, the eigenvalue of your central element and uh, lambda keeps track of the simultaneous eigenvalue for the finite dimensional Cartan, or rather I should write it as T. Um, so, and again, there's some nice feature that when you talk about characters for these things, you also get an energy grading for free. So there, there is, there's a Sugawara construction for any affine value. And so the point is that the characters, they're naturally functions uh, of sort of the, on the finite dimensional Cartan, but then also one extra variable tau, okay? And so these characters, what they define for you, they define meromorphic functions on the finite dimensional Cartan times the upper half. Okay, and so um, these admissible representations that the physicists were interested in, so let me try to approach what they are in two steps. So, so the rough idea is that they're the analog of what a finite dimensional reduct, finite dimensional representation of a reductive Lie algebra is, or rather a semi-simple Lie algebra, I should say. So there's some sort of, in some sense, they're like the simplest representations of the Lie algebra. So the most immediate way to formulate this kind of thing for an affine Lie algebra is to talk about integrable modules. So normally these are the ones which the action of the Lie algebra genuinely is obtained by differentiating the action of a central extension of the loop group. And so, um, so they have nice character formulas, um, which again involve these data functions. And so let me just briefly show you what these look like. So for again, so for a weight lambda, which again is a finite dimensional weight plus a level, um, if you write Q check, for either the co root lattice of G or under some basic form, you can identify it with the long root lattice of G. 
you can make a theta function now of several variables. And so again, basically what it consists of is the z's keep track of which element in the lattice you're taking, and the q records the squared length of your lattice vector. Okay. And so um, when you do this, uh, there, there's a nice character for the integrable representations. So namely, um, so the integrable representations, they only exist um, at sort of at levels when k is a positive integer and sort of sort of each one has, has a nice character, which kind of, it looks like the finite dimensional file character formula, but with the feature that sort of you replace the exponentials that you would put in the vial character formula with certain data functions. Okay. So, um, so those are the integrable representations, but um, we want to talk about a more general class of representations called the admissible representations. And this is one of the times when the representation theory of affine algebras, it really has a feature that just does not have a counterpart for finite dimensional Lie algebras or general Katzmann Lie algebras. So it's something very beautiful about the relationship to conformal field theory. So namely, um, there's a whole family of such representations, not just for positive integer levels, but for any positive rational number. Um, and so um, these admissible representations, you can, again, there's some nice combinatorial parameterization of them. Um, and they admit character formulas, which again- Can like I ask a question? Please. So uh, here we incorporate the uh, critical shift. So uh, yeah. Q bigger than zero is bigger than critical. Yes. Huh? Thanks. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Thanks, Ivan. So again, um, so one way in which you can see that these things behave like um, either integral representations or even just a finite dimensional representation of a reductive group is that they again have something like the vowel character formula. Um, where again, it's a ratio of sort of sums of theta functions. Now, a beautiful feature when you're at one of these non-integral rational levels is that the theta functions in the numerator, they're not associated to the same lattice we were using before. So namely, uh, what you use is a, it's a different lattice, which is exactly the lattice which shows up um, for, for those of you who like quantum groups in the discussion of the quantum Frobenius. So namely, it's the lattice you're finding is, is the root lattice of the metaplectic dual group. So in what sense are these admissible representations, the analogs of finite dimensional representations of reductive groups or integrable representations at a positive integral level? So a really striking feature is that you can try to answer this question by taking quite different perspectives. So one, you can ask for sort of modularity properties of your characters. Two, you can sort of, so there's, there's a whole story where representation theory of affine Lie algebras is, is the same as the representation theory of certain vertex algebras. And um, sort of at a positive integral level, uh, the representations of the Lie algebra which integrate to the group are the same as the representations of the vertex algebra which factor through a certain quotient of the vertex algebra. And so you can play the exact same game at a positive rational level um, that also would cut out some class of representations for you. So then, then a, a third more modern approach you can take is sort of using ideas from quantum geometric Langlands, you can make sense of what an integrable representation or what the integrable objects in any category acted on by the loop group at a positive rational level should be. And um, if you take any of these three different tacks, at least somewhat conjecturally, all three of them point to the exact same set of representations of the affine Lie algebra. Um, so if you wish, a way to think about these admissible representations is, uh, in some sense, it's, there's some, there's some quantum Langlands duality, which is transforming, which sort of roughly will tell you that sort of, the totality of all representations of the affine Lie algebra at this positive rational level, in some sense, it lives over, um, well, it, it carries, how does it, it, it somehow lives over some, 
space of local systems having to do with uh, representations of a metaplectic dual group. And uh, sort of you can make sense of integrable objects using this picture and you get, uh, you, you get these admissible representations. Okay, so let me just quickly show you in an example sort of how you parameterize these things. So if you were working at a positive integral level, um, say P, then the way you parameterize them is you just make an interval from zero to P. So that has um, P plus one, many elements in it, and you only take the things in the interior of the interval. So I'm hiding a row shift here and I'm sort of saying just like take things in an alcove and throw out the things on the walls. Okay, and so if you're working at a fractional level, P over U, the nice thing which happens is roughly you get the same picture you had for P. So, and let me just say this for U is equal to two. And you also sort of get sort of translates of this. So you also go now from minus P over two to P over two. And again, you take sort of all the integral points in between. So in this case, half integral for you shifted. Okay, so the point is you get uh, sort of, as you increase the denominator, you get more and more representations. Okay, so um, now we can say what the conjecture of Frank katz wakimoto is. So what they said was that if you take an admissible representation of an affine Lie algebra, and you apply BRST to it, again, a priori, you get some complex of W modules. And the conjecture is that you either get just zero or you get one simple W module in a single cohological degree. And so in fact, they predicted more. So they did some Euler characteristic or residue calculations and they had predictions about, you know, for each level K, uh, which lambdas, which, which simple modules should die, which ones should survive. For the ones which survive, what are their characters and what cohomological degree do you find them? Okay, so um, to state what the previous work on this conjecture has been, I should mention that sort of in their paper, um, sort of in recognition of some complication that arises when you pass from SL2 to a higher rank group, they also introduced something called the minus BRST reduction. And so roughly what that consists of is when you do this BRST procedure, you don't kill the raising operators, but you kill the lowering operators. Um, and sort of also importantly, the, the character you put, it's not tuned to sort of the F's tensor T inverse, but it's just the F tensor one. So the rough picture is you're trying to sort of conjugate around the BRST functor to make it sort of transverse to the Iwahori subgroup. Okay. So in their words, uh, it's important to consider both reductions because the plus um, can be obtained using techniques of conformal field theory, whereas the minus reduction is in many respects simpler. For example, it's easier to calculate sort of the highest weight vectors uh, for the putative single object you get after a reduction. So here were the previous results on this. So at the time they made the conjectures, both were already known for SL2 by work of Fagan and Frankel. Um, so they kind of stood open for a long time. About 15 years later, Arakawa proved the conjecture for the minus reduction in a really, a really beautiful work. And so, in fact, he showed that the minus reduction, it's T exact on all of category O and sends any simple module in category O to a simple modular zero. And so um, these were consistent with the predictions of Frankel Katz Wakimoto for the minus reduction. Uh, so in this case, there are no homological shifts. There are no homological shifts, that's right. Um, so this, this was already visible at the level of characters to Frankel Katz walking on. Um, basically there was no science when you took the, when you took the residue. Um, and then, so these, these very important results of Arakawa, um, let me just mention that a, a different proof of them was given uh, in sort of first the paper of Sam Raskin uh, gave part of it from 2016 and then a joint work of myself and Sam Raskin uh, from last year. So for the plus reduction, much less was known. So namely, a few cases were known by the original, this, this work of Arakawa. Um, and then a few more cases followed from some work of Frankel Gates Gori in 20, 2010, and then a recent paper of Arakawa, Kreutzig, and Fagan. 
Okay, so then just the last thing I want to say is that, um, so the result is that the Finkel Katz Wakimoto conjecture for the plus reduction is true. So, namely, BRST, when you apply it to any simple admissible module, it either just completely dies or it lands in one cohomological degree, and what you get is a simple module. And so, more precisely, um, which one survives as exactly as predicted by Frankel Katz Wakimoto? Uh, the exact cohomological degree you get, it's very related to their predicted formula, it's slightly different. Um, and then some final comments are that the argument uh, allows you to sort of treat more general representations than just the admissible ones and do more than just the plus and minus BRST reduction, but sort of there's a whole family of them indexed by elements of the affine vowel group. One of them gives the plus reduction, one gives the minus reduction, and you can give similar statements for all of them. And let me just say a brief word about the proof. So. From the beginning, people knew this reduction was not going to be T exact. Um, and roughly speaking, you can account for all of that failure of T exactness and control where something like an admissible representation goes by proving something like all these reduction functors, you can pass back and forth between them by using intertwining intervals. So namely, co-standard objects in an affine Hecate. OK, um, so that's all I had. Uh, Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for this beautiful talk. Are there any questions? So, so categories uh, uh, at uh, uh, this positive non-rational model uh, level, uh, if you look at composition factors say being admissible this is this is not semi-simple i'm confused i mean is it rational on the cft side or not i'm a bit confused yeah it's, it's semi-simple yeah it's semi-simple but then uh, um, if you when you add more mode you 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 still uh, remain semi-simple even when you extend your functor before uh, 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 as you explained, you extend, you extend, you can extend to a larger class of modules, but it's still, you're still within a, a semi-simple uh, region somehow of supplementations or? Oh, um, yeah, so, the, so how to say it? So, I mean, so roughly speaking, the admissible representations, what they are is like, you know, you have the block decomposition of category O and they're just sort of, they're the tops of just a, a few nice blocks. So, you know, each block has one, project the Verma module and sort of you, know, you take its simple quotient. And so the point is that the nice properties, uh, they just kind of go through, albeit with less explicit sort of important formulas, just, just for any, any simple modules, which are the top of their blocks. And so just for silly reasons, those, because they're in different blocks, the category you get is semi-simple. OK, thank you. Sure. And uh, when a simple module uh, goes to a simple or zero, uh, do you get all simple modules in the target in this way or not? At all? That's a good question. So um, the statement is, uh, and part of the reason why physicists were interested in these is you again get, so when you only plug in these special admissible modules, you get these very special simple modules for um, the W algebra. So for example, for the Pirasora algebra, um, sort of when physicists started doing conformal field theory, they found that the Virasoro has sort of this, this at a few central charges, um, it, it has these little finite collections of representations, which they call the minimal models, which sort of behave sort of like, you know, the finite dimensional representations for a productive group or something. And so the claim is that the, the modules you get by this construction are exactly these sorts of minimal models or minimal series representations. W algebra. Um, so I should say, uh, if you if you do this minus reduction, that's just T exact and everything is nice, you can say a lot more. So uh, if, if you apply this to, if you when you range over all the highest, simple highest weight modules for the affine Lie algebra, you, you get all the simple highest weight modules for the W algebra. So, yeah. Yeah, the, in that case, it looks like a quotient functor. Yes. Like a short yeah. or something. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the, the, the point is roughly, uh, yeah, like the minus reduction, you can, it, it, it basically looks exactly like a translation function. So something where one out of every finite file group many simple objects survives, all the vermas go to vermas, all the dual vermas go to dual vermas. So it's kind of like you're, you're turning on some anti-spherical portion. Thanks. Sure. Yeah. There are more questions? All right. So, thanks to Gobier again. <laughs>